Well, I got good news, guys. Bob, we're rich, man. <laughs> we're finally rich. Uh, I don't know if you guys caught this, but uh, Donald Trump's company, Trump Media and Technology, which sounds like the most cutting edge company in the whole world, they do own Truth, uh, Truth Social. So they did a million dollars in revenue last quarter. That's a million dollars. That's not profits, that's revenue, um, which is equivalent to Shake Shack. That would be one location of Shake Shack <laughs> over the course of a year. Um, but the stock is now worth close to $7 billion. So if you apply those same metrics to paying capital management and the revenue that we do, I estimate my share of the company, Bob, is worth about $6 billion. Lunch is on me, man. I'm a billionaire. Well, that's good news, Rye, because, you know, as you know, you were recently cut out of the will in favor of my <laughs> grandson. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that you're, you're you know, self-reliant now. Well, you know, I, I've never been on True Social before, but they're offering a free Shake Shack hamburger for every time. I think I'd probably go on more often. But, you know, it kind of reminds me of like the dot-com bubble age where there was all this exuberance for, you know, companies that had, in some cases, negative revenues, just way overvalued and no rational reason to be putting money into them. It just goes to show you, Chris, you don't know what you're talking about because that's what I heard all through 99. Bob, you just don't get it. You know, companies <laughs> without any earnings, without any potential revenue, is still a screaming buy. Forget Twitter. I'm on, I'm on Truth Social 24 hours a day. You know what, Ryan? I didn't even inflate my uh, my own value on Hinge profiles when I used to go. <laughs> that's that's crazy overvaluation. I don't know, man. I think you can never discount your value on social on uh, Hinge. <laughs> I, actually have to, I heard you have to sign up for the premium version to get uh, to get to Gary's profile. <laughs> I'm long on Grab's dating app, 100. percent Put my money there. Is there a proxy for that? This this whole period, we always have these periods. We have these cycles because truth of the matter is, no one wants to get rich slowly. No one. <laughs> and, you know, you look at the Warren Buffetts of the world, you look at the Charlie Mungers of the world, they got wealthy slowly, but nobody wants to do that. They want get yeah. rich quick schemes. And you're wondering why so many people get scammed, you know, throughout our career. Well, it also is indicative of the fact that, you know, we talk about that famous uh, John Templeton, Sir John Templeton, he was knighted, famous investor said that, you know, if you look at bull markets, they're born on pessimism. We know that people were very negative two years ago. They grow in skepticism. I think, you know, we were probably some of the only optimistic people in the economy, on the stock market the last two years. They mature in optimism. I think we're definitely in optimism now because there's a lot of strategists out there that were extremely negative. Like we're on TV with you, uh, Courtney. All of a sudden, they're magically very bullish and they die on euphoria. And I just feel like that little bit of euphoria is starting to seep into these markets because you're starting to see some crazy things. And don't get me wrong, I'm very, very upbeat about the uh, potential for Trump technology and media, but it might be a little overvalued here. Yeah. And I think that really became like a barometer as to did people think Trump was going to get into office? And now that he's in office, you're seeing that stock is very directly related to that sentiment as opposed to the fundamentals of the company. Like if you actually follow like the betting markets as they showed Trump was winning, that stock was going up and it had nothing to do with like they had more revenue. It was much more with the betting markets, which was kind of interesting. And I think that's what you're seeing, not just that stock kind of across the board. It's that like almost like gambling, like theory where people are saying, okay, I want to be in this next thing that I'm going to make my get rich quick scheme to Bob's point. And people are just really having a risk on appetite right now. Bob, does it look to you a lot like the late nineties? I mean, in terms of the way the animal spirits are out, or is it not exactly the same thing? It looks more like the 1920s to me. I mean, I think, I think, listen guys, I believe we're at a big booming economy. And, you know, I think that the big mistake that investors are making right now is they're investing in what's hot right now as opposed to investing in the best of the rest. There's amazing opportunity out here. Small cap stocks are dirt cheap, right? They usually sell at a premium to large company stocks. I remember back in the 70s when you were a Wall Street analyst, you followed the small company stocks because the large company stocks were boring. Nobody wanted to invest in them. They, you know, they're, they're uninteresting. And, if, and the same thing's happening today. Everything, everybody knows everything about the large company stocks, but small, mid-sized company stocks, that's where the opportunity is. So I think it's its different in terms of, you know, the, the opportunity is tr truly terrific and tremendous. Um, but, you know, I, I think a lot of investors are making big mistakes today that they didn't make in the past, right? Either they're all in or they're all out. And I haven't seen something like that in a long time. Yeah, I don't know. You know, I was talking to Gary the other day about uh, buying some small cap stocks, but he said, Chris, no, that's not the answer. The answer is NVIDIA. <laughs> the answer is always NVIDIA. We know that. 
But I think it is an interesting time um, because obviously we're talking about deregulation now. We're talking about you know, tariffs uh, across the pond. We're talking about tax breaks for corporations, uh, for individuals like ourselves. And all of that seems very, very inflationary. And we've talked a lot about this. And I think one of the biggest maybe underappreciated risk, if you're Donald Trump coming into your presidency right now, is, well, everything's already hot, right? When he came into uh, power before, the S&P 500 was trading at a much lower multiple. Inflation was a lot lower. Our deficit spending was a lot slower. So right now, I mean, you really come to a period where inflation could potentially heat up again. Market valuations are a lot higher, and we already have a huge deficit. What makes me nervous is Donald Trump proclaims he's the king of debt. <laughs> like, do you want the king of debt coming in when the deficit's already a big problem? This all feels very, very inflationary to me. Well, how could it be inflationary if the Fed's, Fed's lowering interest rates? <laughs> Again, more fuel to the fire right now, right? So, you know, it, it is a really interesting time because typically when you have, you know, economic growth that's hot like it is right now, you don't have the Fed cutting interest rates and they seem hell-bent on continuing to cut interest rates, which is kind of crazy to me. And I think last year was really interesting, and I don't know how much people have been following this, just, you know, if you don't do this day-to-day, -day, is since the second that the Fed started lowering interest rates, bond yields have been rising. And it's happening because basically the bond markets are saying, we don't believe the Fed has inflation under control. So, you know, I think theoretically you can talk about this, but markets are actually saying that they don't believe it yet. And they think inflation might be coming back next year. So it's something to keep your eye on as an investor. Have some of those inflation hedges in there if that's the case. Well, I think based on that, my new saying is don't fight the Fed, but don't fight the bond market either. Yeah, I believe the bond market and I also believe in Gary's dating uh, <laughs> validity. I think they're both two things you can bet on. Well, I'll tell you the thing that really worries me is, and I, I swore I wouldn't do this ever again on the podcast because Ryan does it every week. Um, I was going to beat up on the strategist and the economist who now have been predicting that the de the S&P may get to 5,400 this year. Here we are at 6,000. And now they're falling all over each other to make a bold prediction. I think it's going to go to yeah, 6,050 yeah. now. Um, but, you know, there are strategists that are coming out now saying, we're going to go to 10,000 on the S&P. Now, remember last week, guys, we were talking about how people were uh, tempted and, and it, they were so en enamored with the 5% Treasury yield. And then we had to point out, well, you know, that takes a whole year to get that return. You know, now they're talking about S&P 10,000, which means... Dow 70,000. Now think about that number, 70,000. We were at 18,000, you know, when we hit the uh, COVID low just four years ago. So you're going to have people saying, well, I'm getting in right now because we're going to 70,000. Well, it's not going to happen tomorrow, right? It'll get there eventually. But it's, you know, it's hard to get people to, you know, take their foot off the gas when all of a sudden you become enamored with one number. No, actually, I'm going to talk trash on the on the strategist. Uh, most of them like up their estimates for the year to like 6,100. Well, thanks. The market's at 6,000. Big leap yes. of faith there, guys. Drives me crazy. Yeah, right. That was very bold. Come on, that was bold. <laughs> <laughs> Way to stick your neck out there between now and the end of the year, which probably means it's going to go higher. Well, that's the thing. It's like, you, you know, and who cares? Who cares about round numbers, right? Um, I remember when they, when they came out with Dow 35,000, right at the peak, at the top of the, uh, you know, 2000 market. And, and we got there. It just took 20 years. So, you know, the key is, is to, you know, is, is to hire people like Courtney, right, who keeps you from putting it all on red and focus on the plan, right? We want to see you score and win big, but you got to stay invested. But you got you to have a process that keeps you invested because no one really understands the stress, the agony, the torture of being at 100% long, equity portfolio when the market's going down every single day, every day. And that's going to happen again. I don't know when, but it'll happen. Um, you just got to be prepared for it. Sounds like a rough road to 70,000. <laughs> it is. The road to heaven is paved with good intentions, Chris. <laughs> so, Dad, on, on the note of 70,000, you know, if the market does go to 70,000, will you say at that point, I've made enough? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How, hey, guys, how about the psychology of money? They write about, he writes about that all the time. And you have the concept of enough, like you just spoke about, Chris, and some people just don't. What about moving the goalposts? Have you had any clients move the goalposts recently? Well, it's funny. I was actually talking to my client yesterday, and she said, Chris, this is going to sound really stupid, and I probably sound crazy, but you know, I really wanted my 401k to get to $1.9 It's there now, and I think I want it to go to 2.5. 
She goes, does that sound crazy? I said, no. I said, you're very human. I said, everybody feels that way. I said, that's why we do the financial plan to find out what the concept of enough is. You know, are you actually reaching your goals versus some pie in the sky number that doesn't mean anything? You know, Chris, I was thinking the other day, one of my Jeep Jetta to turn into a Ferrari. Is that unrealistic? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, dad, knowing you, there is no dream. Yeah, yeah, that's, I think that's, yeah, it's in the bag, buddy. Um, but no, it's a great point. And like, what a great way to misery, um, you know, constantly being like, I need to get this next number, next number. It's like the old proverbial, keep me off the Joneses. And I think right now, again, we've talked about this a lot, but it's more dangerous than ever. You know, you really have to put the blinders on, look at what you need, decide on what return you need, as opposed to like moving that goalpost. And I think that's a mistake a lot of investors are going to make right now. I think it's harder in this day and age too, where we see everything on social media. Like it seems like everybody has like higher returns than you. Everybody got an NVIDIA before we did. Somebody has a bigger house than us. Like I think more so than the past is always in your face. And I think that's why people are always trying to get to that next goal. But it really is that concept of like, what do you, you actually need to retire? And it's good to run those numbers and stop comparing yourself. You know, I think especially social yeah. media is a dangerous game with it like that. Amplifies everything. Absolutely. Social media is the death of becoming a good investor. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, Gary, you've been hanging around with us for what, 10 years now, which is insane. Um, you know, you listen to us talk, you know, what, what have you gleaned from this? I mean, what, what's enough for you? I mean, there's always a bigger guy at the gym. I feel like <laughs> no matter how small you really, go. I've never, I actually have never experienced that. I feel like when I go to the gym, it's always my biceps are just a little bigger. So uh, yeah, that must be hard yeah. for you guys. I don't know how that feels. But yeah, it's a very, it's a very subjective thing. And obviously, uh, once you get one thing, you want to get another. Uh, I've been recently trying to get into biking a little bit more, and uh, I recently found a bike that I kind of like, and I'm already eyeing a new bike that I want to get. So. Uh, it's a little bit more expensive, you know, <laughs> but there's always something better and there's always something more. Again, I just need one bike to get me from places, place from this place to the next. But uh, again, it's a very subjective thing. I actually hear it's uh, if you put that you have two bikes on the hinge profile, it increases your uh, clicks dramatically. <laughs> <laughs> That was the plan all along. <laughs> you know? Well, you know, it comes down to human nature, guys. You know, people don't change. I mean, I. I remember back in the 80s and 90s going through financial plans with all my baby boomer clients because we were all baby boomers. And the universal question I would get at the end of, you know, a lot of meetings, not all, but a lot, was not how am I doing, Bob? Not, oh, good, we're on our way to achieving our goals. But how am I doing versus the other baby boomers? Am I winning? Am I, am I lagging? You know, am I middle of the pack? You know, it's, it's, it's kind of a competitive attitude. And and a lot of it has to do with scarcity, right? There's there's that concept of scarcity where you think, well, there's only so much return around. I make I make sure I get my piece. You know, I, I got to get more than Gary does. You know, because <laughs> I don't get it, Chris might get it. You know, so it's a, uh, you know, it, it's pretty funny. Fortunately, the concept of diminishing marginal utility, where each additional utility is supposed to bring you less pleasure than less, applies for food but doesn't apply for money. I feel like that's very interesting. Uh, I had, I had. A whole slice of uh, pizza the other day. It was so good. I had the next one thinking it would be just as good. And it was just a little less good. Uh, and the third one, I was like, ah, I could take it or leave it. But I, kept I never eating. bought that, <laughs> actually, economic theory. I always feel like that third piece of pizza tastes just as good as the first. <laughs> but thank you for bringing some real high rel economic data to our uh, podcast for once. A real mo an economic model from, from our room. <laughs> I'm pretty sure those are the most intelligent words that have ever been spoken on this podcast. Congratulations, Gary. You can come back. <laughs> Hey, hope you're enjoying the most recent episode of Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. But if you want a more hands-on approach and you saved over a million dollars, Bob, Chris, and I will put together for you our total financial master plan, and we'll do that with no obligation or cost. It's a full holistic review. We literally look at everything. We go as far as building you, your own personalized financial portal. We'll give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial life, and we'll hone in on every financial issue you need to address today. Whether it's an income plan for retirement, how do you take social security? How do you draw from your portfolio? How do you factor in inflation? We'll build a dynamic income plan for you. We'll look at diversification. Has your portfolio been up and down with the markets, extremely volatile, or have you been sitting in cash? Paralysis by analysis, you can't figure out what to do. We'll put together a full investment game plan, tied to your goals, show you how to grow your wealth, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life and we'll look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products. 
whether it's an annuity, mutual fund, brokerage product, we'll do a deep dive of every investment you own. We'll show you how to reduce the cost, optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's not what you make, it's what you take. You'll get our full tax playbook. If you want this full holistic review and you saved over a million dollars, simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan or click the link below to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's the tipping point. It's where we pinpoint the pain point. Of course, that's P-A-Y-N-E. Having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And, you know, guys, it feels like the markets every single week are just getting more hot, more speculative. It's almost like Wall Street uh, is going to Vegas as opposed to bringing Wall Street to Main Street. We're bringing it to, uh, I don't know, what's the big avenue there? Where all the casinos are on. On the strip. On the strip. Thanks. <laughs> there you go. Shows you how much they get Wall Street to the strip. I was in Vegas once and I don't remember Someone much. doesn't gamble. See enough, how good yeah. that was. <laughs> but there does feel like there is more of a casino like energy uh, to the investment environment right now, where, and we're hearing this sometimes with clients, kind of like, hey, like I want to get in on all the action. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Actually, I was talking to a guy in my running club yesterday and he was telling me about all this sports gambling that he's doing. And then in the next conversation, he was telling me about how he's shorting all these stocks. Yeah. You start hearing about shorts. You talk about going long the market. You hear th remember things like straddles, Bob? I don't even know what a straddle is. <laughs> but I know <laughs> you were talking about. They, they, you start hearing all these esoteric technical terms. Um, you know, people are like studying the charts now. And you know when you're studying the charts, uh, over time, that typically is a really bad strategy. Well, it's funny because if you ever go to the casino, what'll happen is you can get in like a hot streak, right? So maybe you're at like the craps table or you're a blackjack. And those tables are just kind of boring. There's some people playing. But then when you'll see when somebody's having a hot streak, all of a sudden, all these crowds will come around the table and they all want to be a part of it. And that's what happens in the stock market. It's like they see this hot streak happening and they want to get in. All the crowds are around. But usually if you're at any of those casinos, you'll see like that hot streak will end and it usually ends pretty quickly. And so that's where you don't necessarily want to be where all the crowds are. You probably want to be at that other table where the hot streak hasn't started yet. And I think that's what you want to think about when it comes to the stock markets. Yeah, but you know, everybody wants to think that they're different, right? We all, even though we're all average, normal human beings, we project the future based on our most recent experience. But, you know, we're very fortunate because we have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of clients that we're talking to all the time. So we have our finger on the pulse of where sentiment is. And hey, look, I can't blame people for being overly aggressive and overly bullish. We've just had an unusual year, right? We've had 40 new highs on the S&P this year. That's an all-time record high. You know, the average is 29, guys. And some years there's no highs at all. So, you know, it's truly a momentum trade right now. And everybody wants to be more brave. And and the problem is when you talk to your friend, they tell you all about their winners. And I always ask one question. With every dollar, you have every dollar in that one stock, that one call option, that one investment. I, I just keep hearing Kenny Rogers as you're talking, Bob. You got to know when to hold them. <laughs> you got to know when to fold them. And the problem is like, you know, you forget about the downside. And that's, I think, where we're at now. It's like we have very short memories when it comes to investing and I, I think if you invested through the dot-com bubble bursting, like when I started in the business, Bob, we started our firm paying capital management during the great financial crisis. And those downturns are just horrific. But, you know, all of a sudden it's like, we don't even think about those downturns that can possibly happen. It's a great point when you go to the casino, you know, that hot streak only lasts till it doesn't. And it seems like it's more about odds and probabilities. And I remember we all went on a big trip I uh, was in Puerto Rico uh, for a, a team trip. And I remember G-Man was at the, you know, he was at those those roulette tables. <laughs> I think you were gambling down there, weren't you? I was trying to learn how to gamble with all my money. Did you make any money? I told everybody I did. <laughs> <laughs> but did you? Perception is reality, man. <laughs> That's the real truth. <laughs> <laughs> what really happened at the casino? That's what we want to know on this podcast today. But yeah, yeah. right. That was a, that's a great juxtaposition of, of markets, right? When we, you know, 1999, 2000, we literally had people going all in, right? But it didn't go all in with us. They were picking up the phone and calling someone else. And of course, it was huge losses over the next two, three years. You know, when we started paying capital in 2009, 2008, how many phone calls did you get asking to go all in? I don't remember ever getting one. As a matter of <laughs> fact, I remember pulling teeth to get anybody just to put a little bit of money into the equity market back in 2008. That's like, this is something you and I often talk about you know, when we get, you know, we go to Atlantic City a couple of times and you always say all that marble doesn't pay for itself. You know, people never talk about their losses. You know, it's the same thing with people that speculate on individual stocks. 
they say, oh, you know, I do this, this, and this. And then when you look at their portfolio, invariably they have a lot of tax losses. It's funny. The analogy I feel here is like when you go to a Goldman Sachs office, people always talk about how beautiful it is. There's lots of mahogany. <laughs> they got the best china. And I had a client once say to me one time, because he was pitched by Goldman Sachs, and he's like, I wonder who's paying for this. It's like, you are. <laughs> because those products they build, you know, they're just so full of like, you know, fees that are embedded. And typically they end up not being the best places to be for your money. It's shocking. Um, but yeah, like it's so almost like buyer beware. And, you know, it's, at some point, I think what happens with markets when you get into, you know, you oscillate from fear and greed is they do become casino like when you start getting closer to what we call, you know, irrational exuberance, which it feels like we're kind of on our way there right now. Yeah. But you know what, guys, from a selfish point of view, truth be told, I love these periods when we have irrational exuberance. I love seeing the market go up huge every day. And I love seeing speculators just pour in hand over fist because that means we've got 20 years of runway of new clients that we're going to be fixing portfolios over that period of time <laughs> because all good things must end, unfortunately. It's kind of sadistic, and, but it's only Bob, temporary, I like it. But that temporary ending can be very, very painful. Bob's handing out those high roller cards. <laughs> G-Man, what are you seeing with your friends right now? Are like people talking a lot more about the stock market? I mean, you're, you're in your early 30s. You're like a younger millennial like what what are what what is kind of like the vibe amongst your friends you guys talk about stocks crypto when we're not talking about the election we usually talk about uh <laughs> um, wait there's an election yeah i mean all of my friends who were during um, during covid who had all this extra money were uh, trading options are now have stopped doing that just because they don't want they don't have the time to do it anymore i'm starting to get a few texts from them that they've been asking me about my portfolio how they <laughs> how they should be positioning themselves and I feel like it's also for our generation, it's a lot of um, other responsibilities coming in. Some of these people are getting uh, married, so they don't want to take that much risk. But anyways, I definitely think the interest is, interest is starting to pick up again, especially this year. Market, you see, it's making all-time highs over and over and over again. So uh, that FOMO is definitely creeping in. And uh, people who had like stopped trading during COVID times are definitely coming back. They want to, uh, maybe, hopefully not as much as take on as much risk as they did before, but definitely there's some interest. Picking yeah, animal up. spirits are coming back. It's funny, I feel like it, anecdotally, it kind of reminds me of, you brought up when we went to Puerto Rico earlier this year, we went there as a, a company trip. Um, and we, we all went to the casino, which I was actually there with my husband and Bob, your son-in-law was sitting there with us. And I was actually one of them that hit a hot streak on the hand. So of course, I Courtney like, hit a hot yeah. streak. <laughs> <laughs> I think G-Money touches turns to gold. <laughs> but it was fun. We were sitting there with our parents' night out. We didn't have our kids with us. And what happened is I was actually up a few hundred dollars, which is very exciting. It doesn't happen too often in blackjack. And, I, and we started to lose. So I said, okay, we're going to take all of our chips. And I took my husband. I said, let's, let's call it because this isn't going to last forever. <laughs> And just like right now where everybody's trying to get into the markets, like you're talking about as they're high, we were at this high point. We were on this streak. And so he tells me, no, let's take everything and go put it on red <laughs> at the roulette table because we could double our money. I was like, or we get up with nothing and then we don't have any of these gains. And that's kind of what you're seeing right now is that excitement of, wait, but this could be worth twice as much. Bitcoin <laughs> might go to 160,000, so the 80,000 it's at now. But as the advisor and the you know correct advice I gave was no, let's cut our losses or cut our gains yeah. while it's up there and leave with our profits. And that's what you should be doing in a time like that on the market. And, and by the way, you just define the male brain when it comes to investing. That's perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they say statistically women make better be investors yep. than men. And being the financial planner on top of that. Um, but yeah, I think that's the dangerous mentality you're starting to get. It's like, wait a second, I'm getting great returns here. If I put more money there where I'm getting great returns, I'll get even greater returns. Um, but we know that the downside risk can be horrific, you know, once the party stops. And I think with Bitcoin right now, up over 80,000 is a perfect example. I saw some stats on this. Six out of 10 of Americans still have no confidence or trust in cryptocurrency. Um, and something like 17% of adults uh, only own cryptocurrency, which is the same number as 2021. So clearly there's not wider adoption. Um, last time I looked, I don't know, maybe I'm using Bobcoin to buy a lot of things, but not Bitcoin. Um, so adoption rates really aren't going up. The user case isn't going up, but man, oh man, the speculation is continuing to rise here. And I suspect at some point that's not going to end well. And by the way, I was taking side bets looking at Courtney and Dan. <laughs> so in Puerto Rico. <laughs> <laughs> he still didn't in make Puerto any money. Rico, he still didn't I make had my money, money on <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the derivatives. <so. laughs> All 
All right, it's the hidden facts of finance. Random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob. The 94-year-old Warren Buffett, hard to lose 94, who oversees Berkshire's biggest stock investments, has cut the size of the company's largest equity holding, Apple, by a whopping two-thirds to 300 million shares since the start of the year. He's also trimmed what had been the company's second largest holding, Bank of America, by 25%. Since mid-July, Berkshire is now sitting on a gigantic $325 billion cash position. That's a lot of cash, Bob. You know, I've always argued with G about this. You know, he always said that uh, Warren Buffett was the smartest investor in our lifetime. I argue it's Charlie Munger. Now, I don't think Munger would have allowed Buffett to go in and interrupt the compounding of his assets intentionally like this. Put $300 billion into cash? That doesn't make any sense. Now, well, B Buffett is selling which does say that maybe these markets are getting a little overheated. Well, and I think what's interesting is when this news came out, this is what he has done in the past. We don't actually know what Warren Buffett or Berkshire Hathaway is doing right now. And especially with the election, all of this kind of like euphoria coming in and the animal spirits being out, it'll be really interesting to see on their next report, are they doing anything with that cash? That's the big question. Yeah, good point. I actually think uh, they should be calling us because I think we have got a couple really good ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Just let me tell everybody that's listening to this, I know Warren Buffett and you're no Warren Buffett, right? So, <laughs> you know, anybody thinks like, I got to follow what Warren Buffett does. He's a multi, multi-billionaire. You and I are investing for our goals for the rest of our life. You know, you don't want to be a, look at him as a Pied Piper and, and follow him over the cliff. Yeah, but you know what? He, he even says himself that, you know, buy and hold is the best strategy. You know, just put money in, keep investing, don't sit in cash. I like the Warren Buffett strategy. Uh, so also, I feel like that's uh, that's where the smart money is going. And if you can, I feel like that kind of indicates the exuberance already in the market. So there you go. All right, Chris, electricity rates have already been heading higher. Average retail rates jump 17% from 2021 to 2023 and are up again this year. Demand from electric vehicles, factories, data centers are some of the reasons for this big rise. Analysts have projected that data center power use could triple by 2030 and account for as much as 10% of total, U total U.S. electricity demand. Let's buy some utility stocks, man. You know, I think the biggest part of that is Gary's uh, Bitcoin mining operations causing uh, <laughs> an increase in demand. But yeah, I mean, we need, to, we need to get more power. We need to get it soon. You know, I'm all for the nuclear option. No, I think it's a big deal. I think, you know, bottom line is like you're hearing about all these crypto mining operations are actually starting to you know, basically give some of their electricity to some of these uh, AI firms because they need more of it. Yeah, they're actually having to put back online a lot of these old nuclear power plants just because there's not enough energy to go around right now that they're having to tap into some of these other sources, which is pretty fascinating. The world needs more electricity. You heard it here first. I got the power. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Courtney, the U.S. share of world's market cap is around 60% today. The U.S. hasn't always been the biggest market capitalization. Japan was bigger in the 1980s when Bob was driving a Jaguar. But the U.S. is currently 10 times bigger than any other country, which is kind of crazy, though. Emerging markets are 85% of the world's population, 60% of global gross domestic product versus the U.S. is only 25%. Yet it's only 10% of the total market capitalization of the world. Maybe we should own emerging market stocks. It might be the time to buy them. Yeah, well, if you listen to our podcast enough, you've probably heard us preach that before, right? And why you need to be well diversified. Um, but there really is a huge discrepancy here. And a lot of this is recency bias where we say, oh, well, the U.S. has been the best performer the last 10 years. Why would we want to be anywhere else? And I'm also hearing a lot of that post-election where Trump's in office and they're saying, no, Trump is going to put tariffs on China. I don't want to own any emerging markets. But I don't think you want to discount the rest of the world, which is a really large part of GDP and some of the biggest populations in the world also. I mean, they're not going anywhere. The obvious trade is always the wrong trade. <laughs> what do you think, Gary? Where would you put your money today? Emerging markets, U.S. You're, in, you're a man of international mysteries. So what do you think? <laughs> I've always been a big uh, advocate of emerging markets. I feel like um, if you're looking for value, it's hard to look. It's easy to look two years down the line, but it's very difficult to look 10 years, 15 years down the line. And I think the real value is in the international, uh, if you're diversified very well in your portfolio. All right. You heard it here first. Well, I mean, you're from Nepal. Do uh, you see a lot of changes happening in Nepal? I know you haven't been there for like a year or so, right? But have you, has it changed a lot? I know it was like a 10-year period that you didn't, you weren't in Nepal and then you came back. Yeah, there's obviously a lot of infrastructure change, uh, but 
kind of sticking to uh, energy. There was a time when I was back in Nepal, we didn't have uh, electricity provided to, like, not just me, but my family. It was just for the majority of the city didn't have, and this is in the capital, didn't have electricity for maybe 15, 16 hours a day. So I feel like not just in the United States. And that has changed since I've been back. So now you have, more, you have electricity all day when you go to Nepal? Yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. So, Whoever says uh, the U.S. is not a great place to be. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the world, again, needs electricity and energy. So, All right. I like it. I like it. That's the, the, the world view. You know? Perfect. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoyed the latest episode of Pain Points of Wealth. If you love our podcast, we well, you know you love our podcast. Please give us a five-star rating on iTunes, Spotify. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can like this episode, subscribe to our channel. Click that notification bell to be updated week, every week of all our new content. Your support gives us the support to continue to do this podcast. That's it for this week. Stay loose. And as always, keep an open mind. Thanks for listening to The Pain Points of Wealth. Hopefully, you found the ideas discussed in this episode valuable and useful for your own financial journey. You can find out more about Bob, Brian, and Chris's firm, Payne Capital Management, at BeBullish.com or through the contact information found in the description of this episode in your podcast player or app. Join us next week for another episode of The Pain Points of Wealth, brought to you by Payne Capital Management. Information provided on today's show is provided for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment, tax, or legal advice. Investment is obtained from sources that are deemed to be reliable, but their accuracy and completeness cannot be guaranteed.